As I was preparing, I got to thinking about what brought me here today, what brought me to this point. Because this is not me. I don't volunteer for this stuff. I don't want to do it, don't like to do it. But it just seems like I keep getting called back up here to do it. And I blame Shane Smith for that. Uh, I think back a few years ago, I was plenty happy sitting right back there, three rows from the back, all the way on the right there, and letting the professional do the work. And then Shane Smith catches me in the corner back there one day and just kind of throws it out there like, hey, I got to work next week and I'm supposed to have communion. Could you uh, fill in for me? In about the space of about two seconds, about 100 excuses went through my mind of why I couldn't do it. And none of them worked. <laughs> and then, of course, I look at Shane in the eye, and how do you tell him no? I mean, come on, a face like that. <laughs> how do you tell him no? <laughs> but no, Shane, seriously, thank you. You were listening to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit told you to come ask me. And the Holy Spirit was speaking to you, telling me to get off my butt and start doing and so now the rest of you got to put up with me. Uh, but of course, even though I know this, it doesn't make me not resist. It's in my nature. It's what I do. So a few weeks back, I knew I was coming up here. And God had told me, you're going last. So I figured, you know, I got plenty of time to prepare for it. And I told Heather one night we were laying in bed. I was like, this is what I think God's telling me to do. She didn't say anything. Nothing. No response. So my response was back. I was like, well, maybe I'll just do a terrible job. And they'll never invite me back up there again. Because seriously, if you guys really know me, you're about one ornery streak for being taken for a ride. <laughs> um... So me and Heather came up with this ex exaggerate plan on how to make this happen where you guys made sure I didn't get back up here to speak. And let's just say that it had to do with, uh, I was gonna come up here in character, <laughs> like, you know, Southern gospel, you know, ranting and raving, hellfire and brimstone. About that time, Heather was going to stand up. This was her input into this. She was like, I'll stand up and be like, I told you he's got a demon. <laughs> and I was like, that's perfect. That's perfect. I was like, because about that time, I'm going to start shaking and twitching and foaming at the mouth. Kirk's head's going to explode. <laughs> Sharon Dillinger and Debbie Verdon were going to come running up and give me a flying demons out. That was going to be it. <laughs> going to be it laid out. <laughs> but in all seriousness, he, he has called me to, to give you guys a message. And if anything at the end of this, if you know anything, if you take anything from this, know two things, that I love you and that I need you. This church has been on a journey for a couple years. It's changed so much in the six years I've been here. So much. My, my mother and me were talking on the way to church today. And just in the couple years that she's been coming here, how much the church has changed. And this message is, is telling you guys not to stop short. Okay? Uh, there's consequences for that. And the consequences don't necessarily mean you. But it's the people around you. I mean, look, at, look around you. We're supposed to love each other. And when I don't do, somebody in here suffers. If I don't give the message that the Holy Spirit puts on me, then somebody else suffers. Uh, the scripture we're going to go in today is from Genesis. It's about Jacob. And I'm going to skip because it's a very long story. Uh, Jacob is not one of my favorite characters in the Bible. 
just the beginning of his story is enough to make you not like him. He's a cheater. He's a liar. He doesn't care about really anybody but himself. For a bowl of soup, he steals his brother's, you know, uh, inheritance. And I consider it stealing. Because who here wouldn't feed their brother if they're starving, if they're hungry? He goes out with his mother and sets the father up to steal his, uh, to steal his brother's blessing. And then top it off, he's a coward. Because when he finds out Esau's mad and what Esau's planning, him and his mom get together to convince dad to send him off to go find a wife. And he runs away. So just those things there make me not like this guy. But God still is faithful to him. And he's got a plan for him. So we go to Genesis 28, verse 12 and 16. Jacob's on the run. And he comes to a place that he eventually names Bethel. And it says, He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth, with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done that. <clears throat> I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. Then he goes on and he builds a, an altar and you know, sets up a pillar, pours oil on it. And he goes down to, to his uncles and finds, finds a wife. In fact, he finds two wives. It's a pretty screwed up story. Then he, he, he gains their, their, their handmaidens. And, you know, but the point is, is even this encounter with God and this promise from God, Jacob has not changed his heart. He's still lying and he's still cheating. And I, and I know scripture says that his uncle keeps changing his wages. But if you look at it, Jacob is not dealing with his uncle in a fair manner either. He's conspiring. Yeah, he want, he's, he's made his uncle rich, but at that point, now he's, he's conspiring to steal those riches. And he's still a coward. Because when his uncle figures that out, what's he do? He grabs his family up and he runs away. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> um... So his uncle's angry, and he's pursuing him. And uh, God steps in and intervenes. Makes it right. He ends up, Jacob ends up, you know, making amends with his uncle. And then his brother comes out and meets him too. And God makes that relationship right too. And we come to our next verse from 33, 16 through 20. So that day Esau started on his way back to Seir. Jacob, however, went to Succoth, where he built a place for himself and made shelters for his livestock. That is why the place is called Succoth. After Jacob came from Paddan Aram, he arrived safely at the city of Shechem, or Shechem, however you say that, in Canaan, and camped within sight of the city for a hundred pieces of silver he bought from the sons of Hamer the father of Shechem, the plot of ground where he pitched his tent. There he set up an altar and called it El Elohi Israel. Now, if you remember right, God told Jacob to come back to Bethel. I'm going to grow you here. This place here is about 20 miles from that. I know it sounds, that's pretty close. 
That's not where God told him to go. And if you think, oh, well, maybe Jacob was only planning on, you know, staying for a little while, why'd he buy the land? Why did he name the place? Jacob was setting down roots. He seen a city that he could grow rich and he could grow powerful from. And I don't think God was on his heart at all. I don't think through any of it he was worried about following God. And here's where we start to see the consequences of Jacob's actions. Sure, he comes up 20 miles short for here, but I think he'd been coming up 20 miles short the whole time. In chapter 34, it talks about his only daughter. Now Dinah, the daughter <coughs> Leah had born to Jacob, went out to visit the women of the land. When Shechem, son of Hamor, the Hivite, the ruler of that area, saw her, he took her and he raped her. It's a harsh, harsh lesson. But we see the, the, the real consequences in the next actions that go on. We see where Jacob's heart really is at that moment. Because Jacob starts to deal with them. Like, oh, we make amends here. And he sees a way that he can advance himself and become more powerful. And it ain't until his sons step in that the problems really start coming around. You see, Jacob goes in and starts negotiating with them on, well, Shechem likes my daughter. We'll just marry her off to him. And let me just stop right there. Because let me tell you this. If I didn't like Jacob before, I really don't like him now. I really don't like him now. But God's still faithful to him. I, every bit of me wants to hate this guy. But God's still faithful to him. His sons, at this moment, they come up and they're like, well, you can't marry her to these people. They're not circumcised like us. And Jacob, he's like, you know, you're right. You guys got to get circumcised. So, of course, the men there see an opportunity, too. Like, these people, they're rich. We could marry into their families. We can become richer and more powerful ourselves. All we got to do is practice a little religion. And if you want to see pure religion, you look at this right here. This is pure religion. You get circumcised, you can be just like me. You can have the same God as me. You don't have to give up anything. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to do nothing except get circumcised. If that's not a case of pure religion, I don't know what is. What happens next, you see exactly what Jacob coming up short has done to his family. His sons, it was all a plot by them. The whole circumcised thing was meant to disable the men of the city. And they go in, they get together, they gather up their boys, and they go in and they sack that city. And they kill every man there. Scripture says they carry off the donkeys, the animals, cattle, women, children, riches, everything. And after it's over with, Jacob says, what have you done to me? I can't stay here now. He's still thinking about his riches. What have you done to me? Everybody around here is going to hate me now. They're all going to come against me. And that's where God shows back up. In 35, God comes to him. And he says to Jacob, go up to Bethel and settle there. Build an altar there to God who appeared to you when you were fleeing your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, get rid of the foreign gods you have with you and purify yourselves and change your clothes. Then come, let us go up to Bethel, where I will build an altar to God 
who answers me in the day of my distress and who has been with me wherever I have gone. At that moment, Jacob realizes what he's done. He realizes his religion and his willingness to do what he wanted instead of what God has done. And it says they, 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 they take off their rings and, they, and he buries them under the ground, you know, and he forces them to get rid of their idols. And he goes back to where God told him to go in the first place. And it's from there that God really starts to grow him. But here's the thing. It doesn't stop there. Jacob and his family still suffer the consequences thereafter. And it wasn't until I was really reading into this and studying that I realized that, the, that, you know, that the distance in this place was 20 miles. And as I was coming to that, I came to this. These are the same people that sold Joseph into slavery. Now think about that. This is after the fact. There was still a lasting consequence. You've got a mouthy little brother. What do you do with him? You slap him around a little bit and you, you put him back in place, right? You don't sell the guy to slavery. <laughs> I'm just saying. But they went there. And Reuben, the oldest of Jacob's son, he's, he's, he's number one on the list anyway. By right, by law. Look what's in his heart. He goes and sleeps with his brother's mother. You think he wasn't trying to set himself up over his brothers there? Just proving the fact, the arrogance in him? And I know scripture goes on to say he's the only one who felt bad about selling Joseph into slavery. He went back and tried to save him, right? But do you think that he was really doing it for his brother? You think he was doing it for himself? You think he wasn't going back to save him so he could say, Hey, look, Dad, I saved him when everybody else sold him into slavery. I brought your beloved son back to you. There's consequences when we don't do what the Lord asks us to do. Now, God's still going to use us. He's still faithful to us. But other people are going to suffer, not just you. And it's going to be the ones sitting to the left and right of you. It's not just your family. It's this family. So what do we do? We've been on this journey as a church. So what do we do? Are we content with where we're at? Because if we look down the road, we're still 20 miles away. We've come a long way. But if you think that this is really what Jesus wants for us, that this is all he has, I really don't know what to say to that because I know he wants more. For you, for me, for my family, for your family, and for us as a church. And what's that look like? I don't necessarily know what it looks like for you. I know what it looks like for me. I know what God's put on my heart. But I don't know what he's put on yours. To me, it looks like three things. It looks like confession. It looks like repentance. And it looks like testimony. It looks like edification of each other. Unfortunately, Relationships aren't always built in great circumstances. Most of the time, relationships are built in the bad. When I think of my army buddies, it doesn't matter how long it's been since I've seen them. Whenever I see them, my heart still jumps. And that's because for a year, we went through it together. Together every day. I can remember my buddy Bob. He's about 6'3", about 210, 215. At that time, maybe a little heavier now. <laughs> but I can remember him crying because of the way his wife was doing him while we were gone and there was nothing he could do about it. Nothing. Helpless, hopeless. It's those things that brought us together. And if I don't do 
when God tells me to, what am I really doing for you? If I don't share the hard things on my heart, what am I doing? Am I allowing our relationships to grow? Am I allowing you to care about me? There's a quote that I'm going to give you from an atheist. You've probably heard of him. His name's Penn Gillette. He's from the magic duo of, of Penn and Teller. And he's a pretty hardcore atheist. But this is what he says about Christianity. He says, I've always said that I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe there's a heaven and a hell, and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life, and th you think that it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward. And atheists who think people shouldn't proselytize and who say just leave me alone and keep your religion to yourself. How much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe everlasting life is a possible and not tell them that? I mean, if you believed beyond the shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you and this is more important than that? That comes from an atheist. Do you know how convicting that is of me? I say I believe there's an eternal life, but I don't want you to have it. I'm not willing to help you get there. What's wrong with me? I got some apologies to make today based on that. And Kirk, you're the first one. Back in Guatemala, I lied straight to your face. Do you remember it? We were sitting in church. And they had told us, if you got a word from the Lord, get up there and speak. And you're sitting next to me and you retch over, nudge me. You're like, get up there. I was like, no, I don't got anything. I, was li I lied straight to your face. I did get up there. It's not because I wanted to. It's because the look of, on your face convicted me so bad. Because it, I knew right then the Holy Spirit told you to tell me to get up there. And the look of doubt in your face. The Holy Spirit told you. And you looked at it and you're like, what? I know the Holy Spirit told me to. But it made you question it. And I know it sounds light folks, but it's big. It's huge. Julie's in the back, you know, watching our children. But I'm still going to apologize to her today, too. She can watch it on video later. I was supposed to do this two years ago. This message right here. Very little change in it. Scripture was different. But I was supposed to do it, and I didn't. You might remember me standing up here and giving my testimony during a communion meditation. Well, God had told me you were supposed to give this as a sermon. And I resisted that. Julie was one who told me, I feel like God is telling me to tell you that you're supposed to preach. The exact words that I'm out of my mouth were, oh, Lord, no. <laughs> now, the funny thing about it is, and remember me telling you how God's faithful. After I was done giving my testimony, the feeling I got from God was, I'm pleased, but I'm going to use this later. And I wondered, how are you pleased with me, but I didn't do what you told me to? It's because he's faithful, and he always comes through, and he still loves me. But for Julie, here she is, the Holy Spirit speaking to her, telling her to tell me I'm supposed to, supposed to preach. When that doesn't happen, what's that do to Julie? 
What's that do to her heart whenever, well, I know the Holy Spirit said it, but you didn't come through. And lastly, I need to apologize to you as a church. Because if this message was something you needed two years ago and I didn't deliver it, how much have you struggled in something? So I'm sorry. Fact is, is I need you guys too. I need you and that's not easy for me to say. I needed Shane to tell me to get off my butt. I needed Kirk to tell me. I needed Julie to tell me. I got one more for you. Most of you heard me pray out loud for the first time today. And I've prayed and I've talked to God about it and God's told me that he would rather me pray in silence and not ruin what me and him have. It's because I don't normally pray like that. I don't. Uh, a lot of times there's not any words. I just pour out my feeling. And at the prayer service, a while back, I had my head down and I was buried. There was tears dripping down my face. I was making puddles back there. I was hurting bad. But I kept my head down. I didn't want anybody to see. And George Thompson came up and prayed for me. Put his hands on me and started praying. And what he was praying about was accurate. Very, very accurate. Too accurate. George was an answer to my prayer at that moment. See, because whenever I pray, whenever I'm down in my depths, I'm only asking for one thing from God. And that's for him to tell me he loves me. That's it. And if people like George don't step up and answer and go pray over people when the Holy Spirit tells them to, I would not have heard from the Lord that day that he loved me. And I'm telling you, I was at the bottom of the barrel that day. So thank you, George. Now, if some of you feel like this is right for you the same way that I feel, I'm not telling you to jump up here in front of the whole church and confess all your sins. Okay? I'm not telling you that. Pray about it. Think about it. Know what you're getting into. Know that I'm not going to reject you. And if the church does, you can come back there and sit three rows from the back all the way over there on the right. And me and you can have a good chat about the freedom that, that Kirk preaches about every week. Because that's what this is about. It's not anything that's coming, that's, that's blindsiding us. We all know what's there. And the last thing I'll tell you is, remind you, that there's consequences that are coming up short. I just want you to remember that. For me, this is not the end of the road. There's still a long road to be traveled. And I know what's back there. I'm not going back there. I can't turn left. I can't turn right. All I got's forward because I can't stay here. Thank you.